And now, introducing the lead panel to start the conversation on the future of antitrust. Our panelists are Melanie Aiken is co-chair of Bennett Jones's Competition and Foreign Investment Practice and Managing Principal of the Washington, D.C. office. Melanie previously held various leadership positions at the Competition Bureau Canada, including most recently as Competition Commissioner. Bill Kovacic is Global Competition Professor of Law and Policy and Director of the Competition Law Center at George Washington University School of Law. Bill also serves as non-executive director with the United Kingdom's Competition and Markets Authority. Bill was previously chairman and commissioner of the FTC, among many other leadership positions. Bill McLeod is partner at the Washington, D.C. office of Kelly, Dry, and Warren. Bill is a former section chair, a former director of the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection, and former counsel to the Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. Rich Parker is a partner at the Washington, D.C. office of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. Rich previously served as the director and senior deputy director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. Anat Raoult is global head of competition policy at Facebook. Anat previously served in leadership positions in both federal antitrust agencies and as a special advisor to President Obama's National Economic Council and the office of Vice President Biden. He was also, formerly, counsel to the Committee on the Judiciary of the U.S. House of Representatives and counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. John Sallet is Senior Fellow at Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. Previously, John served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division and General Counsel of the Federal Communications Commission. And your moderator for the session, Gary Zenfagna. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, panelists. I'm thrilled to start the summit with this uh, panel talking about the future of antitrust. This panel today is designed to give everyone a sense of the issues that will be highlighted and discussed at the Fall Forum live in the Transition Task Force report and at the Chair's Showcase Program at the spring meeting live. We actually uh, are going to take these out of chronological order uh, in our discussion today and start with the chair Showcase. The Showcase Program will address the ultimate question of whether legislative changes are called for, and if so, what? The discussion will be framed by two papers being prepared, one by Carl Shapiro on competition and concentration in the American economy, the second paper by Maureen Nolhausen, uh, which analyzes the various proposals that have been put forward. Let me start by um, introducing Brian Ryu, who <laughs> will be uh, fielding the questions from the audience today. Please uh, ask your questions, provide questions to Brian, and he will, he will channel them through um, for our discussion. So with that, let me start uh, first with John. John, we hear that antitrust needs to change because the, of the growth of market concentration and market power. Do you think market concentration and market power has increased? And if so, what are the implications for the future of antitrust? Thank you, Gary. And to, before I start, I just want to say, because of my work for Phil Weiser in the state of Colorado AG's office, I want to emphasize these are just my personal views. But my personal view is this, that understanding long-term changes in the economy should inform the investigations enforcers bring, the questions they ask, the resources they need, and the cases they litigate. But importantly, should not decide any particular case, which should always be determined on the facts specific to it. So, for example, think about some of the current literature. Carl Shapiro has two articles out, 2018 and 2019, in which he identifies some long-term trends in the economy that include corporate, corporate profits rising significantly over the past few decades, and Carl talks about a rise in incumbency rents, that is to say excess profits earned by firms whose positions are protected by high barriers to entry. He points to evidence that price-cost ratios in the U.S. have risen in recent decades, and he notes that labor's share of GDP has significantly declined since the 1980s, which raises the question of whether employers have growing market power in labor markets during a time in which there was a significant rise in income inequality as well. 
And then John Baker in his book, The Antitrust Paradigm, identifies multiple reasons to think that firms exercise substantial market power and that that market power has been growing. And among the topics he discusses in this context are the, is the four decade long decline in the rise of startup businesses. So we need to identify risks in terms of what markets look like today, not in terms of what they might, might once have looked like. And the poster child for this is vertical mergers, right? At a time when Robert Bork was writing that vertical mergers did not pose a significant threat, one might have thought that upstream and downstream markets were perfectly competitive. And if they are perfectly competitive, there's much less concern about vertical mergers. But the new focus on vertical mergers has come at a time when people recognize that if there are upstream and downstream oligopolies, the circumstances have changed. So the old conclusion no longer obtains and vertical mergers need a much closer look, which is why the issuance of the vertical merger guidelines this year was a very good thing. Looking forward, here's another issue, and it's one Nancy Rose and I have an article in a forthcoming issue of the University of Pennsylvania Law Review where we look at efficiencies in horizontal mergers. And thinking about the economic literature, it seems to us that the way federal antitrust agencies think about efficiencies tends to rely on an overly optimistic view of their existence and their magnitude. Sometimes in the literature that's referred to as the standard efficiency credit. Well, the implication is that if the assumption about efficiencies is off and too great, then the market concentration measures used in the horizontal merger guidelines may be too lax. And Michael Winston in a new paper reaches a similar conclusion. So we recommend in this context that market concentration thresholds should be reexamined and very probably lawyered, uh, lowered, but lawyered always, but lowered in this instance. So the point of this is we are looking at the new evidence and, and we're using new tools, right? Fiona Scott Morton and John Baker have emphasized that economics has identified many tools that identify and measure anti-competitive conduct. That is to say, we changes in market concentration and market power require us to think anew about issues we thought we had solved, but we need to rethink them in light of current circumstances because antitrust, and I think this is the bottom line, can't get the right answers without asking the right questions, using the right tools, taking into account the market conditions of the moment. Great. Thank you, John. Bill Kovacic, what are your thoughts on the question of market concentration and market power? Thanks, Gary, for the opportunity to participate in the panel. Congratulations for the start of your section year and best wishes for a great year in the section. Thank you. I, you get the impression in looking at the modern literature that nothing's going right, uh, that we're in a cataclysm where in sector by sector, things are going to pieces. I, I thought it would be useful to think about one area in which arguably things are going in the right direction and to study that example as a way of thinking about how to address concentrated sectors. And that deals with launch vehicles. I, I suspect over the summer, one bright spot has been to watch the success of NASA and SpaceX with the Crew Dragon mission to the International Space Station and the return of the two US astronauts to Earth uh, on August 2nd. 20 years ago, the company that made that possible did not exist. SpaceX was created in 2002 by Elon Musk. And Musk was asked at the time, uh, how, do you make a, how do you make a small fortune in the rocket business? And he gave the punchline that's been used in other sectors. You start with a big fortune. And Musk spent hundreds of millions of dollars of his money to try and make this happen. If you were trying to lay odds about whether or not that would succeed, in the mid 2000s, you would have said it's most improbable. There's no way that SpaceX will become an important complement to the United Launch Alliance, which is the joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed Martin. But that's just what's happened. And SpaceX has prospered to become arguably the most significant <coughs> provider of launch services in a sector where entry was thought to be virtually impossible. And SpaceX has been joined by other firms, uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' company, 
Um, several others that are creating a new commercial market for spaceflight, both in low Earth orbit, but also with possibilities for further explanation. How did that happen? Uh, one is that NASA, the Department of Defense, used tools available to them in the government procurement arena to facilitate entry. And I think a big lesson there is how government procurement with the massive sums that the national government spends can be a mechanism for opening the door for entry and expansion and the development of entirely new technologies. A second lesson from it is that beginning in the early 1990s, the two federal enforcement agencies looked at lots of defense mergers. And what were two of the crucial focuses, especially for launch services? One is vertical effects, foreclosure, and in case after case, they obtained settlements that sought to make sure that vertical foreclosure possibilities would not be realized in practice. And the second thing they did was to focus overwhelmingly on innovation-related concerns. And the agencies built an enormous amount of know-how focusing on innovation because price effects were secondary considerations in these transactions if they were considered at all. So what we have is a form of big antitrust data in the form of knowledge and experience with transactions that have taken place over the past 20 years dealing with this sector and a very important entry story that was the result of conscious government practices and policies. And on John's point, a lot of interesting data and information about when efficiencies come to pass. When the United Launch Alliance was formed in 2006 with the approval of the FTC, the two companies said a benefit will be higher reliability. From the formation of that venture in 2006 to the present, the United Launch Alliance has made 140 consecutive successful launches. They've done everything they said they were going to do and SpaceX has become a great entry story in parallel. Instead of forgetting everything we've learned, it's really worthwhile in this area to spend time focusing on the great body of data and experience we've accumulated, which is very directly related to how we go ahead in the future. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Bill. Very interesting um, and very timely. Um, let me ask you another question, actually, Bill. Uh, for our uh, showcase program. You're familiar with calls for reform uh, of antitrust. You've spent a lot of time studying how competition agencies as institutions can best do their job. Do we need to consider the institutional strengths and weaknesses of our antitrust agencies, law enforcers, and courts as we contemplate whether or not legislative changes are appropriate? Uh, the institutions are the essential foundation for success in, in any area of law. Uh, to use the space analogy again, I, I spent three years uh, in a law firm working for one of the companies that was a principal supplier to the Apollo program. And one of their engineers once told me that the physics of going to the moon was pretty straightforward, but the engineering was really difficult. And in our field, the physics are the big concepts about what the substantive principles should be. We tend to treat the engineering, the implementation as an afterthought that will sort itself out. Well, it doesn't. We can't just say like Captain Picard, make it so, do it. You do it through institutions. And I see three areas uh, where we need a lot of attention. The first is the capability, the capacity of the public enforcement agencies. We've seen in a sense this movie before. In the late 60s and early 70s, there were intense demands for competition agencies to address the most pressing problem of the time, which was the perception that there was excessive industrial concentration. That was held out as the biggest failure of antitrust law. The FTC and the DOJ were urged to get into the arena, and they did in the 70s, bringing a large number of collective dominance and single firm misconduct cases. Some of those succeeded, but a number of them were fairly grisly litigation failures. And a major reason for the failures was that there was a huge mismatch between the capabilities of the defendants that opposed these cases and the case teams that were handling them for the agencies. The agencies could match the other side punch for punch in a few cases, but they couldn't do it when you raise the number of cases you were running at one time up to 10, 11, or 12, which is what the agencies collectively did. And as a consequence, the failures have stuck with the agencies. I think some of the risk aversion that we see today is the residue of those experiences where embedded in the agency's memories are failures that still inflict major wounds on the way they think about things. 
a big lesson here is that if you create huge gaps between capacity and your commitments, you're going to have a lot of failures. And one of the crucial ingredients there, I think, is to raise the compensation. Uh, Dodd-Frank, when it created the CFPB, put the CFPB on a higher salary scale that the financial services regulators have. The CFPB pays its people 20% more than, say, DOJ or the FTC do. I think if we don't raise the compensation, we are crazy if you think you can ramp up enforcement dramatically and take on lots of big, difficult cases in the hope that you're going to be able to overcome the other side. So one crucial consideration is to raise capacity and do it, I think, by changing compensation and focusing on how you can't prosecute lots of difficult, demanding cases if you don't have the right people to do it. Second thought deals with cooperation. If you do an inventory of the US system, you have an unequaled number of enforcement institutions, public and private, two national institutions, sectoral regulators, state attorneys general, and an unequaled system of private rights of action. And you have an unmet set of policymaking tools, criminal, civil, injunctions, reports, studies, rulemaking. The only thing we don't have in a robust way is the market investigation mechanism that the United Kingdom has that allows them to do studies and impose remedies without a direct connection to existing antitrust standards. So you look at the US system and you say, there's nothing, there's no better equipped system. But what we don't have is that it's not joined up. There's no really effective integration of effort on the part of the public institutions. We have no equivalent to what the European Union has with its European Competition Network, which is a mechanism not just for coordination, but for real policy development and integration. We have a only occasionally friendly relationship among the institutions. In 1941, Thurman Arnold, the head of the antitrust division, testified before the temporary National Economic Commission about the future of antitrust policy, and he pled for the commission to recommend that the FTC get a major boost in its budget in order to do studies and to run cases in cooperation with the Department of Justice. Can you imagine hearing that today from the antitrust division? Let's help out the FTC because we want them to work with us to do a better job. Implausible. Nor do we have a real common effort by the public institutions to map out the doctrinal barriers, to map out the successful paths to the summit of litigation success, and then to develop a common strategy to get there. In many ways, we have the existing tools, but we do not have cooperative relationships to make them work effectively. That's a big gap. If we don't overcome that, we're lose, leaving a lot of potential on the sidewalk. And that can be done with no change in legislation. The last thing I'd mention is a rethink of our risk appetite. How much do we want agencies to go and take on more matters? That doesn't happen by accident. That's a conscious choice that involves looking at where doctrine is and seeing where you want to go. I'm a member of the CMA's board. I'm a non-executive directive there. I'm not talking for them, but I've seen how they have adjusted their risk appetite consciously over time. They're taking on tougher matters and they're doing it in a careful way that matches their capacity to deliver and new projects. We are way behind the curve in developing that kind of capacity inside individual agencies and across the public institutions. And I think what we need is a willingness to overcome perhaps the risk aversion that is a remnant of experiences that go back to the 1970s and to be willing to do more. To do it successfully will not simply happen by chance. It will require a lot more effort collectively by the public institutions. So there's a lot you can do right now with the tools that you have, but it won't simply be the result of spontaneous combustion. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Melanie, let me, let me turn to you. Uh, what are your thoughts from a Canadian perspective on the idea of the institutions? Thanks very much, uh, Gary. Great to be here and uh, with all these folks. Um, I think, you know, Bill's comments about sort of the institutional limitations, I think, is so apt. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the adequacy of the tools, um, particularly, uh, you know, among the sort of the platform cases and, and whether, you know, there's killer acquisitions and how do we deal with the phenomena 
of uh, you know big data and the overlap um, for some per- per people or the overlay, um, you know, for even uh, freedom of uh, voice and that sort of thing. I think the different challenges um, are certainly more acute for some agencies than others, and it turns a lot uh, on their mandate, and in particular the flexibility uh, that they have or have not been afforded uh, to pivot. Um, you know, I think the institutional agility, I think we can all kind of acknowledge, uh, particularly in our enforcement agencies, is not necessarily a strength, and that's not a criticism meant pejoratively, it's just a reality. Uh, and, you know, it may make um, these debates and coming up with possible solutions to them that much more uh, challenging. Uh, the one trend that I would comment on um, that I think, you know, something that agencies in particular need to think about um, adjusting to. Uh, you know, we've been seeing, um, you know, uh, an interesting response from smart but generalist judges uh, to the ever increasingly complex uh, uh, com- competition between experts at trial. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, they're just sort of throwing their hands up and saying, well, it just sort of seems like a wash to me. Um, I want to hear from the executives. I want to hear traditional testimony. I want to see the documents. And you have to question, you know, in those circumstances, how compelling a particular export report would have to be and an expert's testimony would have to be in order to actually uh, move the dial one way or the other. Um, so I'm not saying it's necessarily um, a bad development, but I do think it's a departure. Uh, and I think it's something that the agencies very importantly are going to have to adjust to um, in how they evaluate the strength of their case ex ante, how they bring their case, how they argue their case. And again, I think this institutional limitation that just comes and the fact that, um, well, it's partly risk diversity, but it's a number of other things as well that just kind of clog the wheels. Um, that's going to be something that uh, makes it relatively more difficult for the agencies to adjust to than perhaps the parties uh, on the other side. And this issue, I think, is going to be really fun. We're going to address this at one of the panels at Fall Forum, uh, and we're going to have the privilege of hearing from, uh, from Judge Maida and some others uh, on something that I think is pretty timely. Thanks, Melanie, very much. Um, Let me turn to Brian Ryu and ask if we have any questions so far from the audience that we could ask the panelists. Brian? Thank you, Gary. Uh, We're seeing some really interesting questions from the audience in the Q&A box. I'll get started with uh, one from Scott. Do any of the panelists see real potential for significant changes to the Sherman, Clayton, or the FTC Acts gaining momentum in Congress? And if so, why or why not? There's the question. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? I'm happy to address it, Gary. Take a first. Thanks, John. At it. Go. So look, I think just to put it in context, this question is a key part of what is going to be the chairman's showcase when we meet in person at the spring meeting in 2021, right? I mean, Gary talked about this, but we're going to be advantaged by having an economic paper from Carl Shapiro and a paper analyzing such proposals from Maureen Olhaus to to lead into the discussion. We ought to remember, it's been a long time since there was significant antitrust legislation, right? 1950, and a lot has happened in the economy. And I think the key question that's going to be asked is whether case law is putting unnecessary burdens on antitrust enforcement. And there's reason to think it is. Think just about these Mm -hmm. decisions. The implication in Amex, both on transactions platforms, but even separately, on the notion that one has to define a market in vertical transa- uh, vertical restraint cases, even if there's direct evidence of economic harm, or the application sometimes of the no economic sense test, which in a way that seems to me to contravene the rule of reason, or labor monopsony, right, where defendants come in and can say, well, there's no harm to consumers. But that's not the question because the competitive process is harmed if labor monopsony artificially lowers the wages of workers. These are issues that are burdening antitrust enforcement. My friend Michael Cadis likes to say governments shouldn't have to prove that water is wet, but that's sometimes what's going on. I think that's part of the reason, in addition to concerns about long-term trends, why we've seen some legislative proposals, I think we're going to see some more. I think the ABA should think about them very carefully. And I I think it's important that we will look at them and analyze them on the merits. Now, sometimes there's an implication that if something is new or novel, it's it's a bad idea in terms of statutory uh, 
guidance because we know what we need to know about antitrust. But <clears throat> I assume that in 1890 or 1914 or 1950, there was somebody who said these laws are necessary because there's nothing new under the sun. The fact is there was something new under the sun and it helped antitrust enforcement and it was a good thing. And I think we should therefore take very seriously proposals if there are proposals made in the next Congress for legislative change, we ought to ask what the impact would be on furthering effective antitrust enforcement. We ought to consider them on their merits, and we're going to discuss them at the spring meeting. Hey, Gare, I have a, I have an opinion, um, and I, I think what John said was extremely insightful. But I also think we need to put this in perspective. I think what we're going to hear later in this panel today and throughout your year, there's a lot of room uh, under current uh, antitrust doctrine to expand, push the boundaries if that's what we need to do. And I really feel that there's a, I mean, you know, we're all antitrust lawyers, but folks, there's a lot more important things going on in the United States right now. I think we need I think we need a Marshall Plan, the equivalent of a Marshall Plan for the cities, given what we've seen this summer. I think we need to deal with COVID. We need to deal with the next pandemic. Uh, we got a lot more things to do than my opinion, uh, than antitrust, and I would hope the Congress would focus on that and let whoever runs the antitrust division, the FTC, uh, think about the policy issues under under current law. Just my opinion. <clears throat> yes, it is. Thank you. Um, Brian, do we have any more questions or can we move on to the fall forum? We can move on to the next questions. Okay, let's move on um, to the next the next topic, which is the fall forum. Melanie, who is co-chair with, with Anat of the fall forum. Melanie, let me ask you a question. So we're living through a crisis of the kind we haven't really seen before, right? Um, indeed, this meeting is digital, uh, uh, I'm pretty excited about. Uh, at the fall forum, we have a panel discussing, discussing the challenges uh, this crisis poses for antitrust enforcement. What do you think are the critical issues antitrust enforcers need to address in times like these? Uh, thanks, Gary, and I think Rich set this up perfectly. I think, you know, um, there's really a procedural and a substantive and probably many more than one um, ways to look at this. I think it's perhaps easier to articulate the procedural. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the jury's still out uh, as to how well um, things have been managed and are being managed, uh, you know, beyond navigating uh, the logistical and the efficiency challenges that are raised um, by working from home. An economic crisis um, attaches a real premium and a, and a reasonable expectation, I think, uh, that agencies would quickly evaluate um, matters that are coming before the mergers, collaborations, joint ventures. And I say this, you know, beyond just PPE type of uh, transactions. You know, significantly, I would include here that um, I think it's reasonable to expect a sufficiently thorough but an expeditious assessment um, and including uh, a failing firm type of arguments or flailing firm type of arguments in this economy. Traditionally, you know, we sense, and I think certainly my experience has been that agencies want to stay as far away as they can from failing firm. Uh, they want other processes to intervene and deal with it for them, like bank bankruptcy or Chapter 11. Um, but, you know, the responsible approach, uh, particularly in times of crisis, uh, pushes staff and should, I think, push staff and decision makers to grapple and decide these issues and to articulate their reasons. Bureau issued a protocol for the fact that they would not even consider efficiencies, notwithstanding in Canada uniquely as a defense, they would not even consider them uh, unless the parties uh, voluntarily, but not so voluntarily, sign on to a very luxurious timing agreement that gives the uh, Bureau roughly probably something in the range of four to five more months to look at cases. Uh, in my mind, at least, uh, this is directly counter to the reasonable demands that we should be making of our regulators uh, to support the economic recovery uh, and survival. Uh, on the substantive side, um, crisis in particular calls uh, for a genuine conviction, in my view, uh, that you've got a problem with a merger, that there really are going to be anti-competitive effects, 
rather than just a bad feeling in your stomach that intuitively you don't like the looks of it. Um, I mean, I think that's always um, how it ought to be, but I think there's a real premium on that in times of crisis. So you don't just say instinctively, I don't like this, so I'm going to poke around and I'm going to mess with the potential financing of your deal and the very you know happening of it at all. I think it's not even necessarily a specific deal, but it's more the ex ante effects that that can have and the dampening effect that can have on deals even being considered. And so, um, you know, they're pouring cold water uh, on ideas um, that perhaps may look problematic on their face, uh, but because of dynamic or other efficiencies or other market forces, perhaps amplified uh, by current economic conditions that, um, or, or shifts in consumer behavior as a result, that actually would be pro-competitive transactions. And so, um, you know, I think both of these uh, procedural and substantive comments relate uh, to the responsiveness and the increased agility and the increased rigor uh, to follow their mandate, however unfashionable it may be right now, uh, to not get in the way of pro-competitive transactions and to foster uh, the ability of those possible deals to be conceived in the first place, uh, to potentially be pursued if they ought to be, uh, and potentially implemented. Not to say they should never challenge, of course they should. I just think that um, these times do call for a rigor and an attention that I'm not sure we're, we're necessarily seeing as yet. Thanks, Melanie. Rich, let me turn back to you. Do you have any uh, uh, thoughts or further comments on, on this question um, of antitrust enforcement today? Yeah, I just think um, COVID is, um, well, first of all, the tragedy is that people are sick and dying and, and families are being disrupted. Following from that is an economic issue that I think is massive and following from that is an antitrust issue. Whoever is head of the agencies, commissioners or, or assistant attorneys general is gonna be faced with a very, very difficult situation. Uh, what, uh, uh, w uh, there's many, as, as John Salad eloquently put it, there is a serious question as to whether there's too much concentration in the United States. And if that's the case, and if you believe that, you sure don't want to make it worse. And then there's others on the other side who take a different view. But even if you take the, the view that concentration is not a problem, you don't want to create it. And so you are going to have to figure out what the balance is because you're going to have small companies, vital companies, previously vital companies who are in serious trouble uh, and want to be bought by, by whom? Bought by the companies that have thrived during the pandemic. And that would be, guess whom? The platforms and some others. Uh, and uh, I wish I, I, that is an extremely difficult issue and it will have to be sorted out case by case the old fashioned way. But I will tell you, and I will predict having been an enforcer myself, this is gonna be, become very, very difficult. And I think it's the number one um, challenge in my, in my opinion. I think you're right. Thanks, Rich. Let's, let, me, um, let me move on to another question um, to a knot for um, relating to the fall form. So, uh, not another topic that uh, the forum uh, will be uh, looking at is the future of antitrust enforcement, especially given the call for greater enforcement and increased activity of state and uh, state attorneys general. Okay, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges the, that the antitrust enforcers are going to see in the future? Thanks for the question, Gary, and um, very happy to be co-chairing Fall Forum with Melanie this year. So, I think of this as three questions. The first is, are enforcers able to bring the cases that they want to bring? The second is, does traditional antitrust understand markets correctly? And the third being, are enforcers converging or diverging in their understanding of these markets? So the first one, are enforcers able to bring the cases that they want to bring? You have some people who say yes, and you have some people who say no. Uh, we saw FTC Chairman Joe Simons and um, uh, uh, Antitrust Division, Assistant Attorney General Del Rahim, um, in testimony before Congress assert that, uh, yeah, they haven't had to scale back enforcement, um, but that they could use more resources. Uh, DOJ's budget has been, the antitrust division's budget has been flat for the last few years. And if you adjust for inflation, I think it's actually um, decreased. Um, and for any of you who've uh, litigated a case in the last few years, you know that the um, 
cost of economic experts does seem to be going up, especially when the big cases uh, rely so much on a battle of uh, experts. Um, the percentage of your litigation budget that goes to retaining these uh, economic experts seems to be going up. So um, you, you would have some enforcers that say, uh, we can do it, but um, but it's just becoming more, more and more costly to try to keep up uh, with the level of enforcement we'd like to see. And then there are people who would say no, that we that enforcers can't bring the cases that they want to bring. And here, um, if you look at the United Kingdom, uh, where I know uh, Bill Kovacic has been advising, um, or in Europe, um, these are really at the vanguard of considering new tools, new regulations that would um, give enforcers uh, newfound abilities um, to intervene in uh, markets. Um, one of these, some of these tools would allow them to uh, change market structure, intervene in market structure without first going through the traditional antitrust analyses of proving markets or dominance. Um, and in the U.S., you see legislation such as what Senator Klobuchar has introduced that would uh, change the standards for bringing unilateral conduct cases in order to shift burdens of persuasion. Um, some of these other bills and, and regulations out there would uh, just put per se restrictions on certain types of behavior. And so there is at least a perception on the part of some policymakers that no, enforcers don't have the ability to bring the cases that they should be bringing. We need to change some of the rules in order to make it easier for them to do so. Um, I think that the second big question is, does antitrust understand markets correctly? And here um, I turn to uh, a, a little bit about what um, John and Rich have already touched upon already. But look, there's a, there's a push for behavior economics to be um, taken further into account in some markets, particularly labor markets. Um, and I think what John and Rich pointed out, look, there, there are broader social issues happening. When you have people who's... Um, real wage growth has stagnated for decades. When you have a large portion of the population that has not reaped the benefits of, of, um, uh, of, of market gains, um, there is a dissatisfaction with the way things are. And policymakers are going to reconsider every tool that they have to change things. And these theoretical discussions about you know, elimination or double marginalization, it's not going to matter when people feel like they, are, they don't have jobs or they're not you know, benefiting from the economy. So, um, so that underpins a lot of the questioning of what has been orthodox U.S. antitrust law for decades. At the same time, you have pushback from the industry, especially in the digital sector where I am, or you have the GAFA companies that argue that the economics of platform competition, for example, and value creation are misunderstood by the enforcers that are looking and investigating those. Third, um, are enforcers converging or diverging in their understanding of these markets? And here we've seen some um, really interesting daylight in the US in the past few years. You have, uh, you saw states moving ahead to challenge Sprint T-Mobile, even after the DOJ had settled. Um, and states objecting to the terms of the Bayer Monsanto and Attorney filing, even after the DOJ had um, uh, uh, reached a settlement of that um, investigation. In Qualcomm, you had the DOJ file a statement of interest to take a position contrary to the FTC, forcing the FTC to respond to the court that the DOJ was misconstruing applicable law on record, um, which is uh, sort of remarkably public. Uh, um, in terms of, of airing uh, a difference of opinion between the, the agencies, which have normally been more aligned on that topic. Um, it even led Senator Lee, the chair of the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee, um, to wonder aloud in a couple of hearings about um, the use of taxpayer dollars for one federal agency to challenge another in court. So I think these are some of the, the big topics that the panelists at Fall, at Fall Forum are going to be addressing on this issue. Thanks, Nat. That's great. Um, John, did you have some follow-up from, uh, from that question? Yeah, let me just make two points. The, as a discursive remark, right, one of the great things about antitrust is the chance to learn from people with whom we practice, right? I had the chance to practice with Rich Parker for a while. It was wonderful. Let me mention two others that I think go to the future of enforcement. At the Department of Justice, I work for Renata Hessel. And what she told us was that 
our goal was as law enforcers to protect competition, right? That, that was the way to approach litigation. Think about who might be harmed first and think about whether one might win or lose spectrum. And I think this goes to the point that Bill made earlier. We need to have a risk appetite that's willing to take chances in order to improve outcomes for people in competitive markets. We, we could try a litigation strategy where we win 100% of the cases, and we might be successful, but law enforcement isn't like the National Basketball Association. Going 100 to zero is not necessarily a good thing if you do it by not taking on big, serious threats to competition, even though you might lose. So I just think Bill's point about risk appetite, what I learned from Renata, is one critical thing to go forward. Second, I'm now working with Phil Weiser in the Colorado Attorney General's office, right? This is the first time I've ever worked on the state AG side. And I think there's an important lesson here as well. We have already talked and not talked about, Bill talked about the limited resources for antitrust enforcement. Well, state AGs are another resource and they can make a difference and they can bolster antitrust enforcement by deploying their local expertise, their general expertise, their additional resources. But that makes it critical that federal agencies work closely and cooperatively with state AGs in order to bring the most resources to bear on some of the most pressing competition issues of the time. And by the way, states can act on their own, right? Colorado had a settlement in a healthcare merger that achieved a specific remedy in a case that the Federal Trade Commission considered, but did not act on for the circumstances in Colorado. So that was an improvement. Secondly, I think states are perfectly well positioned to be plaintiffs as they wish as they were in T-Mobile Sprint. So we need all the resources we can get. We should encourage cooperation among antitrust enforcers at all levels of government. I think that alone will help us improve the competitive process. Thank you, John. Um, that, would, uh, that, would, that, would be, that would be very consistent with what Bill was saying. Um, Brian, let's go to um, the chat box. Are there any questions from the audience at this point as it relates to the fall form or frankly to the showcase before that? Sure. Um, so this question is for Melanie and Rich and, and, and others as well. Um, it's about COVID and living in an extraordinary time like this. Do we think in a time like this that added stability for consolidation should be considered in merger review? Melanie, go ahead. I so just didn't hear whether the very last part of your question. Uh, th that added, st added stability for consolidation should be a factor um, considered in merger review. Uh, well, you know, I guess um, just off the top, I, I think we have to be really careful to make sure that um, the agencies stick with a model that is not over informed by sort of immediate crisis or public interest type of considerations. But to the extent you, when you refer to stability, you're talking about the competitive process and um, you know what's good for it in the long term in terms of encouraging innovation and investment and um, allowing sufficient scale to take advantage of, to a certain extent. I know it's a dirty word, but network effects. Um, you know, then sure, because that is um, directly connected to the competitive process and the health of health of competition. Um, but I think it's a slip, one has to be very mindful. It's a slippery slope uh, to start getting into, you know, industrial policy kind of considerations and public interest considerations and things that I think we are starting to see hints of and is something that um, I would want to be very careful about doing. So I think, um, thank you, Melanie. I think um, this is to me, I thought that's a great question about stability and the like. I mean, <laughs> um uh this is really a bad situation and while if i were a policy person i would be very concerned about concentration or at least not if we don't have a problem at least not causing one um but you know i will worry about people i mean uh this is tough out there 
and as a matter of prosecutorial discretion, uh, I, I would, I personally, I would have to pay attention to a claim that things are really going south out there, government, and um, people are losing jobs and, and companies are falling apart. This is, this company can be uh, revitalized and jobs can be maintained and innovation can occur if we do this merger. Yeah, I would, that would be a factor. I mean, and, you know, I'm glad nobody's saying, hey, Rich, what's the answer here? Because I don't know the answer. I'm just telling you how tough the question is because everybody worries about concentration and market power for good reason. But everybody worries about people too. And this is what you're trying to figure out. And that is why um, um, people in the next job will have gray hair very quickly, in my opinion, if they don't already. <clears throat> Thanks, Rich. Um, Brian, are there any other questions that we want to go through now? We can move on. All right, let's move on. Let's turn to the last topic, which is the transition task force report. And I want to have a question for Bill McLeod. Bill, you've been very patient in, uh, in, uh, in your time. Thank you. Um, Bill, much of the attention at the FTC uh, uh, has been on competition issues, right? But consumer protection is obviously just as crit critical part of the mission. What aspects of consumer protection do you think deserve particular attention in the task force report? Thank you, Gary. Thank you for having me. And patience, not at all. I have been very happy to hear you all talking about consumer protection for the last 50 minutes. We <laughs> all that competition is merely the servant of consumer protection because competition is all about delivering to the consumer the best that the market economy can provide. And that is going to be what will be driving consumer protection policy over the next few years. And I think we'll be touching on this in the transition report. But let's pick up the first uh, item that Rich mentioned because it is going to drive consumer protection as well, COVID. COVID is going to be a hotbed for fraud and already we are seeing both the states and the FTC ringing up cases and investigating more. And I think we're going to see a slew of those cases coming out of the agencies over the next year. And they all underscore one of the most important things about both competition and consumer protection. Neither works unless we have truthful and accurate information in the marketplace. But there are also other developments that are going to be extremely important on the consumer protection front. And maybe the most uh, dynamic right now is privacy. We've all heard that there was an election happening in November of this year. And there is a lot of debate on what is going to happen in the outcome. No one's talked yet about the election in California that is going to consider the referendum on the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020, which could transform the uh, California Consumer Protection Act, or the California Consumer Privacy Act, which took effect just last year. And California, the whole idea of this act is for California privacy rules to drive the United States privacy rules, and also to create an agency in California, talk about institutions that will be about the same size as the division at the Federal Trade Commission that enforces privacy. In the meantime, we have the European Court of Justice invalidating the privacy shield, the major mechanism by which data is shared between the EU and the US, and all of a sudden companies are scrambling to develop individual protocols so that data is not simply shut down. And if information is shut down, what that means is inefficiency and what that means is difficulty for competition. Finally, major cases going to the Supreme Court right now, a question that we did not ever expect to see was whether the FTC has the right to pursue in equity redress for consumers in consumer protection cases that have 
uh, determined that consumers were built of their money. As a matter of fact, one of these cases that is going up is a case that overturned a case that I brought back in my FTC days. The Supreme Court's going to decide whether or not the FTC has the power to return money to consumers. And if you want to talk about legislation for a minute, my guess is that the FTC wins this case in the Supreme Court. If it doesn't, I think we're going to see Congress act about as quickly as it did back in the uh, days of the do not call legislation and rulemakings that the FTC was going through. This is going to be a very critical part of the consumer protection agenda for the next four years. So that in a nutshell is where I see consumer protection going and where consumer protection goes, we can be sure competition will be part of it. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Bill. The good point. Um, Anat, do you have any follow-up you'd like to add to what, what Bill was saying there? So I agree with Bill. I think in the U.S., the, the biggest issue for the next couple of years is going to be where the U.S. lands on privacy. And I think that the, this, the 13B decision, if it ends up adverse to the FTC, will have uh, tremendous ripple effects uh, that, as Bill pointed out, will um, have to be addressed in some form or fashion. The one thing I would add to what Bill was saying was that when I was in the Senate, um, the, I noticed an interesting trend, which is a rethinking of just how much of the onus should be on consumers and how much should be um, shifted to corporations themselves, kind of like a rethinking. Uh, because for a while, uh, look, if you had stuff in your terms and conditions and the user clicked accept or agree, um, the, com the consumer was imputed as having read and understood each of these terms and therefore acting as a rational economic actor based on this information. Even though you knew that it wasn't happening, that people were just clicking and agreeing to things and not understanding what they were agreeing to. And so for the longest time, consumers were almost being penalized um, for certain actions and activities, but um, because they weren't adhering to the way the model was set up. And so what you're starting to see more of are especially with the Senate Judiciary Committee and some of the, um, the Democratic members over there, is rethinking, if you know consumers are not going to be able to read and understand all of these things, how much do you want the burden to be on them? And how much do you either want to simplify it or do you want it to be on the corporations themselves? Um, and that's something that you're starting to see crop up in consumer protection legislation over there that I think is going to be a really interesting rebalancing, um, potentially, if it goes through. Thanks, Anant. Um, let me ask uh, one more question relating to uh, the transition task force. Um, Rich, you, this is for Rich. Rich, you've litigated mergers for the government and for the private parties, including your, the victory, the big victory recently this year, earlier this year on T-Mobile Sprint. Mergers have gotten a lot of attention, obviously, including during this current crisis. What do you think are the biggest challenges that antitrust enforcers face reviewing mergers these days? Well, the number one is what I said and what Melanie said earlier is the COVID issue and the, you know, how you make that balance is in terms of Brian's last question, a, you know, a year ago, I don't think anybody would have given any thought to economic stability, the stability of these, that's just not the, right. it's just not the job. I think now you have to, I, I don't see how you avoid it. Second point is this, is that if you were, whether you are on uh, wherever you are on the spectrum, I think you're going to want to push the boundaries because you sure as heck don't want to create a concentrate a concentration problem, even if you believe you don't have one. Uh, and second, if you believe you have one, you really want to do something about it, and you want to push the boundaries. And that requires two things. Uh, everybody knows my own personal bias. You can't have enough trial lawyers. The agencies right now have some great ones, um, no question, both do. They're both very good in court. My own view is, uh, I think, and, and maybe this goes back to Bill's views on the institution, you got to have more. You've got to be able to go one-on-one -on -one with the firms, uh, take them on, and push the boundaries. The second point is, is you have to, you have to, almost you have to get lucky because my favorite case um, decided during my practice is Microsoft. I think it's the most important. Uh, and it was a case um, 
uh, in you know which 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 shows that strong facts and strong economic analysis one plus one means a victory even with some very conservative judges and so the question is is to find those cases and to back it up with good analysis and to back it up with some great trial work i think that's the challenge i also think it happens to be to be um to be doable all right thank you rich um bill mcleod any follow-up on that well, a couple of things. Rich's favorite antitrust case of all time, of course, was an antitrust case that had a consumer protection. <laughs> and so I, think I meant to say that, Bill. <laughs> Rich has just made my point. I think it is also important to remember, following up on John's and Anand's remarks, is that there is nothing new in behavioral economics on the consumer protection side. Consumer protectors have been monitoring and measuring and assessing consumer reactions to stimulus, mainly in advertising, but also in other media for decades. And there is no question in consumer protection that the consumer's judgment still prevails. But if you hoodwink the consumer into a bad decision, that violates the FTC Act, it violates state consumer protection acts, and it usually will violate the Lanham Act. There is plenty of protection out there for the marketplace and for the consumer and how we blend that in the new considerations of antitrust doctrine to whether we will trust the consumer to make the right choice in this new information age is going to be a critical question. I think in the end, we can still rely upon the consumer with the tools of technology that we have available to decide in the best interest for him or herself, but that has to remain a major part of the debate. Perfect, thanks, Bill. I'm glad that uh, Rich could tee that up for you. Um, so uh, let me just, <laughs> we're kind of running out of time a little bit, but let me ask Brian, are there any uh, questions uh, of the questions that you think we should definitely um, throw out there right now um, from the audience. Um, I, I think we can move on to move on. All right. So I have one last question for um, for each of the the panelists. Um, and given our time, you've got one minute to answer the question, give or take. Um, and I hope I get six different answers. It's the same question for everybody, but I'd like to get six different answers. Okay. Tell me, in your view, what is either the best or the worst thing that could happen to antitrust in the future? The best or worst thing that could happen to antitrust in the future? And let's start, uh, ladies first, with Melanie. Melanie? By the way, I didn't tell everybody what order they're going in. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I was hoping I'd have a little time to think about it. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think, you know, um, I, perhaps I sound a bit more of a throwback, um, and, and I don't mean to in any way diminish the crisis that we're in. Uh, or the imaginative and creative responses that need to be taken in all fields, so antitrust not excluded from that. But I come back, I guess, to um, my view that I think um, politicizing, whether in the name of COVID or whatever it might be, national security, politicizing what we have tended to consider to be a relatively pure uh, antitrust assessment of merger review um, is a risk. I think if we start introducing public interest considerations uh, you really do open the door for some pretty, and uh, some pretty um, um, well, a whole range of considerations such as job losses and things that we have, I think, traditionally found comfort in our paradigm to say, look, um, bias can creep its way into any um, framework. But we do have a principled framework through which we try to evaluate these uh, transactions. And um, I think if we give that up, uh, I think not only do we have risks for outcomes, I think there may be a real risk for a role um, for antitrust because uh, once you start collapsing it into public interest, it becomes a politicized process. Uh, and I see I see real dangers there. And as I said, though, please don't misunderstand me to say that I don't think we should be responding to the crisis in all the imaginative and creative ways we can. It's just I think we need to be we have to tread carefully uh, and not jump in too quickly to try to bring other factors into play. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for going first. All right, that answer's off the table, okay? Um, Anat, what are your thoughts? 
best or worst thing that could happen to antitrust in the future? What I think would be fascinating would be to see more behavioral economics brought into labor market analysis. I think there is a divergence in how we treat uh, effects on low wage versus high wage labor markets. Um, and I think that uh, assumptions are made in terms of how broad the pool of low wage uh, labor is without taking into account factors that make low wage jobs sticky, whether it's, you know, you have a mortgage in town, you have the hours you want, you have the schedule you want. Um, and as a result, I think that we see uh, the same behavior, the same choices that are made in terms of taking a pay cut post-merger treated as um, rational behavior in high-wage markets and irrational behavior in low-wage markets. And I would be interested to see further exploration of um, you know, whether antitrust is, uh, current orthodox antitrust understands those markets correctly. Thank you uh, very much, Anat. John Sallet, for you, best or worst? Well, I'm going to do worst. Happen. It's going to sound like Melanie, but it's different because it's not about <laughs> what antitrust is. It's about how antitrust is enforced. In other words, take protection of the competitive process. I think the worst thing that could happen is if people came to think that tactics of political influence were the right way to try to achieve outcomes in investigations. Obviously, if that were to happen, that's a bad thing in a particular investigation. But there's something bigger. I think if people believe that, it would have a long-term corrosive effect, right? Because the incentive would be hire lobbyists, figure out who knows who, figure out how to lobby people outside the antitrust division. And that would set a trend that would be very, very bad. We do not want a moment when tactics of political influence or lobbying is seen on the par along with economic analysis, factual analysis, and legal analysis. Antitrust is law enforcement, and we want to keep it that way. Thank you, John. Very good. Bill Kovacic, any thoughts, best or worst, that could happen to antitrust in the future? Thanks, Gary. Uh, here's, uh, here's the worst. Uh, a strong recurring criticism in I would say the new critique of antitrust is that the past 20 years have been an abject failure. That the officials who touched the system or worked in the system in that period, if not longer back, were either captured by business interests or to use a term that is frequently applied, corrupt in their failure to do their jobs well. And in offering that view, I'm one of the people in that bullseye, uh, and perhaps others uh, would be considered to have contributed to that process. And in the terms of one commentator, what we need to do to fix the system is burn it down. <laughs> you burn it down, uh, and they're speaking about groups like the American Bar Association section of antitrust law, the ABA is seen as a facilitator here, creating timid and unambitious norms that are passed through to the enforcement process, picked up by academics so that we end up with a system that has no guts and no ambition to do the job that it needs to do. Uh, I don't doubt that the new literature has injected tremendous vitality into the debate. I don't know if you'd be having this panel discussion uh, this way if that weren't the case, and that's very healthy. Uh, the danger is getting the dosage right, and the danger is that, as one commentator said, if anyone had anything to do with that system, don't listen to them. Ignore them, because they've led us on the wrong path. If we do that, we'll not learn a lot about how to do this well. We won't learn about how to do ambitious things like do not call rule. We won't learn about how to bring ambitious, tough cases that the agencies have brought. If you wanna do more and a lot more, uh, it's insane to ignore the successes and failures of past efforts because there's a lot of know-how built into that system. The worst thing that would happen is that you burn it all down with the people inside and you literally decide you have to start from scratch. Scratch. That would be tragic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, I, I agree with that. Uh, Bill McLeod, you're not going to be last now. Well, 
Thank you, Gary. And let me <laughs> just respond first to Bill and say the last time that we had massive dissatisfaction with antitrust enforcement, I know. it was because the courts came up with the centerpiece of antitrust today, and that's the rule of reason. After the government won cases, but the courts decided that they had to apply a cost-benefit analysis, we got the Federal Trade Commission Act, we got the Clayton Act, and things seemed to work out okay. The best thing that could happen to competition today, I think we give competition lawyers six-month details in consumer protection bureaus or agents <laughs> around the country so they understand how consumer protection works in the front lines. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Rich Parker, the last word. I think um, that the best thing that could happen in antitrust is the somebody looking seriously at the criminal enforcement program. Um, if you look at the numbers, the prosecutions and the fines and everything else have gone decidedly south for some reason in the last several years. I, uh, for one, do not believe that the business community of the world has repented of their sins and would never and are not doing this kind of conduct anymore. That's not my view of human nature. And so I can't understand what has happened. Uh, and so I think somebody, some bright people, uh, experienced people need to uh, look at this system and try to see if we're doing something wrong because I cannot understand um, why we are where we are. I think it's a very serious matter. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Rich. Um, listen, let me just thank everybody on the panel. Um, I, I think that was a fantastic discussion, a great way to start off the summit, a great way to start off the year, a great way to start off the issue of the future of antitrust. I thank you all so much for your thoughts and the time you put into, to, you know, we've met a lot with this about this. Thank you for your time and your effort on this. Um, and I think with that, I'll say goodbye. Um, and I think we're going to go to a break. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.